Good afternoon. I'm Chip Flory, host of AgriTalk, and this is Farm Journal's Farm Country Update titled Issues Dominating the Ag Commodity Price Outlook. $6 corn and $16 soybeans are rare. These prices don't happen often. And prices like these are even more rare following a year with a record corn yield, a bigger than expected bean crop, and in a year in which the supply of corn and beans left over at the end of the marketing year is currently expected to be bigger than at the end of the last year. But back-to-back production problems in South America, expansion of U.S. soybean processing, inflation, everybody's feeling that one, inflation, and potential disruptions of global grain flows around the world. And the the other topics that today's panel will discuss are providing U.S. corn, soybean, wheat, cotton producers with marketing opportunities that are rarely seen. To help us better understand the dynamics of the markets, we've got Dan Bossi, founder of Ag Resource Company in Chicago, Ben Brown, senior research associate in ag and applied economics at the University of Missouri, Steve Freed, VP of Grain Research at ADM Investor Services, and Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady. We're going to have the panel tell us a little bit about themselves and hear their opening comments about the volatile markets that we are experiencing. Dan, let's go ahead and start with you. Welcome to this Farm Country Update. Let's hear about you. Oh, Chip, I've been doing this too long. This is my 42nd year. I started Ag Resource back in 1988. Uh, we have offices in Sao Paulo, and I work with a gentleman in, uh, in uh, Geneva, Switzerland named Noel Fryer, and we try to make sense of agriculture. So we're not in brokers, we're just research analysts, and my staff and I try to, to make it right. So that's what we do. Um, if you want an opening statement, uh, we're about as bullish as we can be of agriculture. It's very rare that we get two demand drivers in the same crop here, and that's China buying lots of corn. And then, of course, the South American weather problem combined with renewable diesel. Um, This demand drivers, as we look at it, will take prices higher. We think we're in a super cycle for the next two to three years. Farmers are smiling. Back to you. All right. Now we're going to talk more about that bullishness because being bullish at $16.50, $16.70 beans is a whole lot different than being bullish at $10 soybeans. So we'll we'll get into that as, as the conversation goes on. Ben Brown, University of Missouri. Let's introduce yourself. Yeah, good afternoon, Chip, and thanks for everybody for tuning in. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Uh, so I am a product of the University Extension System all the way through the land grant mission. Grew up in Western Missouri on my family's row crop and cattle operation going through 4-H. Have degrees from three great land grant institutions and, and currently work here at the University of Missouri in my home state. Uh, to tag along with Dan's comments for an opening, you know, it is uh, on the price side or at least the output, there's room to be optimistic uh, for producers. When I look at some of the factors that have led us here, there's a couple of things that really stand out to me. Certainly, weather continues to play a part in that, both domestically and then abroad. I, For the last couple of months, I've been saying that the odds of having the same type of weather, weather patterns that broke perfectly for the U.S. farmer in 2021 uh, were unlikely to happen again in 2022, but it certainly seems that that's playing out in South America. We have increased dryness here in the United States. And then instead of dryness in, in the Black Sea region, we've got a war uh, yeah. about to break out, right? So um, not maybe the same, but, but close. And then uh, geopolitical tensions uh, similar to that, and then the Chinese market, and then wrapping it up with supply chains. And, and certainly for our producers out there, uh, optimism on the output side, but certainly some pessimism when we look at the prices that we're having to pay for products on the input side. So thank you again for allowing me to be here and look forward to the conversation. Man, thank you for being here, Ben. We certainly appreciate it. Steve Freed, ADM Investor Services. Introduce yourself. Uh, well, today is my 30th anniversary at ADM Investor Services. So I've been here for 30 years. Uh, before that, I um, was a crop scout with uh, Continental Grain and toured um, US, Canada, Argentina, and and Brazil crop conditions in in the early 80s. I think that as we approach $17 beans and $7 corn and $9 wheat, you know, it's hard this time of year to be bullish, but I think that at least for corn and wheat, we still have some upside risk in the marketplace. I think Ben talked a little bit about war in Ukraine. We also note that uh, on one side of the bean market, we expect our bean demand to increase. 
But on the other side, um, China's not buying our old crop beans. And, you know, so the markets um, are vulnerable for some wild swings. And I think that so far, the farmer has been rewarding these rallies with cash sales. And I think they should continue to do that. But I think April, May is a possible uh, high in the markets this year and much higher than where we are now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that China is, ha, they haven't been very aggressive in buying old crop beans or 2021 crop beans, but they have become more aggressive in booking 2022, the crop that hasn't been planted yet. So I want to talk about that a little bit more as we continue on the conversation. Brian Grady, editor of Pro Farmer, uh, introduce yourself. Well, uh, glad to be here, Chip, and, and uh, with everybody this afternoon. I, I don't have quite as much experience as Dan and, and Steve, but uh, I have been a pro farmer for uh, 27 years now, uh, going on 27 years, and, and uh, uh, currently uh, editor of the newsletter. Um, you know, we focus on risk management and, and try to help the producer uh, sift through everything that, that we're going to talk about today and help them make educated uh, risk management decisions. But uh, it, there's just been a, a heap of things coming at the markets uh, that has led to these opportunities. And I think you hit the nail on the head when uh, uh, you said that these are opportunities, historic opportunities for the U.S. farmer. Uh, there are some challenges. Uh, input prices are going to be much higher than they were last year. Uh, inflation, as you mentioned, is impacting all of us in, in every uh, form of our lives, and uh, that doesn't uh, exclude the American farmer by any means. And so there are those challenges out there. And, and now we have the, uh, you know, just throw a war on top of it uh, in Russia and Ukraine and, and all that and, and everything that, that's included in that and, and uh, the potential that that adds to it because, the, you know, this week, that's been the price support, uh, especially in the wheat market. Yep. All right. Very good. Well, um Hold on to that thought because uh, I'm going to come back to you on what exactly is moving the markets around right now. As I said, I'm Chip Flory. I've been in the business now for 34 years, 25 of those spent at Pro Farmer and 17 of those years leading up. I was the editor ahead of, of Brian at, at Pro Farmer. Um, I've known Dan for many years. I've known Steve for many years. I've obviously known Brian for how long? 27 years now? Yep, yep about 27 and I'm just getting to know Ben. And uh, Ben, there's a reason that, that I asked you to be a part of this conversation. And it is because you are, you, you have shown a willingness to think out, to imagine some things that maybe the rest of us aren't willing to imagine could happen in these markets and put them in perspective. So keep that in mind as we're going. I appreciate those kinds of thoughts. And let's throw them in there. But I want to go back to, to, to Brian here. Uh, first, to the attendees. I, I know that you've got questions. You've got to have questions about what's going on in these markets. This is a fantastic opportunity to get those questions answered. Use the Q&A or the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen. And the uh, dialog box should come up at the bottom right corner of your screen. Again, the title of this session is Issues That Are Dominating the Ag Commodity Price Outlook. Brian, this week, this week, what would you say is that most dominant factor in the ag markets? Well, I don't think there's any question. It's Russia, Ukraine. And, uh, you know, that's fuel on the fire that's already blazing at this point in time. And, and uh, you know, geopolitical issues, you never know what's going to happen, but we do know that back in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea from uh, Ukraine, that we did see an explosive price movement in both the corn and wheat markets uh, because uh, of the Black Sea region and the importance of that in, in uh, you know, the, the wheat and corn exports out of that region. So, um, you know, we don't know, but uh, front month SRW futures rallied almost 14 percent back then. Uh, front month corn futures rallied about 10 and percent during that uh, three plus weeks. And so you can kind of extrapolate and say, wow, if we add that type of price strength onto what our prices already are, uh, now we're looking at significantly higher prices because we're starting from higher price points than, than what we were back then. Keep that in mind as well. Right. Steve, that's an interesting way of trying to put some um, some perspective on what the potential impacts might be of the 
Russian aggressions on Ukraine. Does that make sense to you? Um, I think it does, especially in the wheat. Um, I think when we look at the USDA numbers in the wheat market, they're, they're probably 12 million tons too high in wheat exports uh, that we won't see out of the Black Sea and we won't see out of Europe. Okay. They might be four to five million tons too low in demand, especially to North Africa where it's been dry. Um, but all those <clears throat> countries need to buy wheat and they were expecting to buy it from the Black Sea. Uh, on the corn, uh, the market is still wondering if 15 to 16 million tons of corn will be shipped out of Ukraine. Uh, Europe needs four to five of that uh, just to satisfy demand. And so if for some reason that wheat and corn doesn't get shipped, uh, the only place people can come to is the United States. And we already have a tight supply, uh, even though it seems adequate. <clears throat> I think that um, for, from my perspective, March through June, we will see a record amount of demand for U.S. corn. And that says that both spreads, basis, and futures may have to rally to try to stop that demand from getting too high. And like Dan said earlier, all of this may not be reported today, tomorrow, next week, next month by the USDA, but it's in the cash markets. And I think that, again, this is something that actually, for especially the beans, is showing a tighter supply and demand for next year, 2022-23, than this year. <clears throat> okay. We're going to come back. You always do that to me, Freed. You throw out a couple of things in there that I think, man, we got to come back and talk about that. And we will. But I want to I want to continue the conversation on Russian aggressions into Ukraine here for a moment. Dan, do you still make it to Ukraine basically every year? I used to, but uh, the last couple of years, whether it's COVID and now the aggressions make it difficult. I do hold a conference in Geneva, Switzerland, and we've invited our Black Sea friends to that where things will be a little kinder. Uh, that's going to be held in May. But, you know, generally speaking, the, the Ukrainians are very concerned, very, of course, anxious about what's happening. Uh, the Russian population was kind of shocked yesterday with Putin's speech of Monday night. Yeah. The ruble has dropped sharply. And so we're all holding our breath in terms of next moves. What's different than this one rather than Crimea is this will rearrange trading patterns. Crimea did not rearrange trading patterns. We had a rally and then the markets fell. If Putin really takes all of Ukraine, this has that kind of potential relative to sanctions. So we need to be a little careful in the, in, in the correlation as it sits today. Yeah. Okay. Ben, the last time that we saw Russia making aggressions on, on Ukraine and, and ultimately taking Crimea, um, 2014, we saw some big moves, but I'm interested, what's your, what's your perspective on, on what is happening in, in the region right now, in the Black Sea region? Yeah, so I'm going to start with uh, the first part here. What do I think is happening? I don't know. Um, I, to be truthful, you know, I, I, I'm not sure any of us know exactly what the the planned outcomes or what the hope is for that region. I, I often make this joke that I play a lot of the board game Risk, and I have never won the board game Risk by invading Ukraine first. Um, <laughs> so I, I am not sure how this plays out in terms of that. But I will follow up, and that was a point I was going to make today. Is what Dan just finished with. This has the potential to rearrange trade out of that region. Region and certainly has, has the impact for commodities that are important to us in terms of corn, wheat, um, oil as well, and how countries respond to that in terms of their actions of limiting that trade uh, from that region and, and then increased export potential from the United States is, is very important. But I think Dan's comment um, is, is of utmost importance, if not the most important comment in terms of how it rearranges trade uh, globally. Now, it, it, if Russia does make the move in, into uh, broader Ukraine. They've already made the move into Ukraine. But if that happens, the it, Dan, I'm going to go to you on this one. Won't the greatest impact come from who's going to step, who would be willing to buy wheat out of the Black Sea at that point? Well, yeah, but if there's sanctions in place, if we really put right. some kind of naval blockade on the Bosphorus, which is the pinch point of the Black Sea, and we don't allow Russian products, wheat and other things to flow into the rest of the world, and you take out the world's number one exporter, it's a really, really big deal. 
And the same would be if you if they go into and they take over Ukraine and that gets annexed, that will be considered part of Russia. And you take out the world's third largest wheat exporter, third largest corn exporter. So all of these things today are, are, are unknown. But when you think of the consequences in terms of global trade, it's really big. And to Ben's point, this is what we're trying to focus and understand. And I think the market's trying to get ahead of it. But even then, it just doesn't fully comprehend what that would look like. Okay. Um, Steve, the, the comment that you made about March, May, or excuse me, March, June corn exports, uh, is that tied to shutting off the supply coming out of Ukraine? No, I mean, okay. it's based on, you know, lower South American crops. Okay. Uh, it's based on higher demand, not just exports, but also domestic demand. You know, when people start traveling again, I think the ethanol demand will go up. And I think that, um, Today, I, I heard that uh, a farmer uh, sold a feedlot corn at 758. And so I think that demand is there, you know, in all the sectors. And so, yeah. you know, if we add two, maybe 300 million bushels of corn to exports, 100 million bushels to ethanol, then all of a sudden you have a carryout of 1,200. And you really don't have any room, especially if tomorrow the USDA says a 181 corn yield. We've never had back-to-back -back record corn yields in this country. And so when we plug in what our weathermen might be saying, it suggests that, you know, we have to have a perfect crop and we have to have farmers plant a lot of acres and there's no wiggle room for any problem. Right, right. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, Ukraine... Isn't it like the world's biggest supplier of sun oil, sunflower oil? Yes, 50% of the world's sun oil comes out of Ukraine. And so not only do you have the soybean oil market at 70 cents a pound and cash yeah. three cents over to a buyer here in the United States. So basically you've got soybean oil to a buyer at, at, at a dollar. And you've got palm oil for three straight days in a row making all time highs. Um, on the Dalian futures, rapeseed oil making all time highs. Um, and Matif uh, rapeseed making uh, six month highs. And so the, the uh, vegetable oil market is seeing, I think, three things. Number one, demand is strong. Uh, number two, I think the US is committed to biofuel. And if we use soybean oil as a jet fuel, we, we may not have enough. And then you've got um, some maybe some lower crops in South America. So our, even though our prices are at 70 cents a pound, we are the cheapest oil in the world. Wow. And we've already uh, put 80% of the USDA's export goal in soybean on the books already. Jeez. Yeah, India's in buying more oil than I ever imagined that they would buy, uh, more uh, soybean oil than I ever imagined they would buy. Brian Grady, um, the front month bean oil contract was showing some hesitancy to move away from 65 cents. It kind of feels like the last two days, even though the market pulled back from the high today, it's starting to feel like bean oil is trying to lead again. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, we talked about the uh, the sun oils coming out of, of Ukraine, but when you add in uh, uh, Russia, it's like 80% of the, the global trade comes out, exports come out of there. So, uh, it, it is a big deal and, and the market is paying attention to it. And that, you know, the, the leadership roles and changing leadership roles that we've seen within the soy complex is important uh, to maintaining price strength over a period of time. So we've seen soybeans lead, we've seen soy meal lead, we've seen soy oil lead and, and that rotational process uh, is important. Uh, the, the strongest markets are, are when you, you take a, a turn leading and you don't have one sprinting out in front all the time. So I, I think that that is a critical component uh, when we look at the soy complex now that uh, we do have multiple leaders within it. Yeah. Steve Freed, when I met you about 35 years ago, 34 years ago, one of the, I, I remember one of the first conversations that we had about the soy complex was don't trust the soybean oil led market. Uh, now, if soybean oil isn't coming along with it, you can't trust it. Well, 70% of the crush is meal, and you always would want meal to lead the way. Yep. But 
Um, so we have to try to figure out from an Argentina standpoint, they're the number one meal exporter in the world. Right. So do they have the beans to crush to meet that demand? Or are we going to pick up some demand in that area? Um, the one thing that the meal market is having trouble with is, you know, China's changing their feed rations um, and they may not import as much beans from us in the old crop as the USDA is suggesting. So I think that when we talk about all time highs in soybean oil, you know, it is in, within sight. And I think that uh, we will we'll take that out. But today, to me, it felt like nobody wanted to be short beans and meal. Going into the weekend, uh, you know, what if yep. we have a war? Yep. Um, versus, you know, that we had some fundamental reason why, you know, 1670 beans and uh, 450 meal had to be traded today. Um, so, you know, today was a day in which I think everybody wanted to get out of the pool. Okay. All right. Ben, I, I would like your take on what's going on in the global vegetable oil market, because it's one of the most dynamic markets I've, I've ever witnessed. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. And I appreciate the comments talking about, you know, soybean, U.S. soybean oil being some of the cheapest oil supply in the world. Uh, we, we continue to, to be there for, for the time being. A lot of this driven by expectations around the, the increases in renewable diesel and uh, I assume we'll get there at some point if this yep. question doesn't get there, uh, get us there for the expectations for, for that market. Certainly, we've seen uh, lots of expansion plans put in place, um, led mostly by oil refiners building those processing facilities. And then the concern comes, you know, how can we meet this additional 50 to 52 uh, billion pounds? Or, you know, how do we meet this 50 to 52 billion pounds of, of soybean oil demand that potentially could be out there? A couple of things that, that I would maybe put up for discussion with the group is I certainly don't expect all that capacity to be built. Uh, we sometimes overshoot these things and I certainly think that's maybe where we're at a little bit at the time being. Uh, it does re reward those that can pivot early and so we'll see that. And then the second thing is it potentially could cannibalize our biodiesel industry, which is not, a, not anything that anybody um, wants to talk about, especially farmer investors that are investing in, in biodiesel facilities. But right now, renewable diesel facilities are, are out competing biodiesel facilities hand over fist. And to be able to um, you know, sell soybean oil as a, as a crusher, uh, most of that's flowing to renewable diesel, or we expect renewable diesel facilities to be very competitive in that market. Um, as a soybean producer, it's, it's all positive, right? But if you're, if you're interested in that biodiesel uh, facility yeah. or infrastructure, it becomes a challenge. And so I think those are two things uh, not to overlook. The um, fact that not all of it gets built, all the renewable capacity gets built. Um, but then the second thing is that we pick up uh, some, some lost demand from other sources that, that feed into that market as well. Be interested yeah. to hear what the other panelists have to say. But that's just I, I want to go to Dan Bossy on that right now, because last week, Dan, when we were down at Top Producer Summit in, in Nashville, after our panel down there, a, a couple of bio, a couple of producers interested in the biodiesel because they've invested in biodiesel asked us the same question. It's a different market, isn't it? It really is, Chip. It's a different market, and unfortunately, the big oil is going to crowd out the biodiesel industry. It just this is the first time big oil has really climbed in agricultural's lap. So as we think about biodiesel, and we can already see it in the monthly data now, production is heading downwards, they're losing money. The losses over the last year for biodiesel producers are the largest in history. For some plants, it's as much as 40% of their working capital. So yeah. when you think about biodiesel, it's a, it's a mature industry that's in decline relative to the $4 a gallon or up to $4 a gallon credit that uh, renewable diesel people are paying in the West Coast. Right. Um, renewable diesel. I, I wanna make sure that everybody understands there's a difference between renewable diesel and biodiesel. Biodiesel is for blending with petroleum-based diesel fuels. B20 uh, is, is a good example of what was commonly used in the Midwest. Renewable diesel is a drop-in fuel. You fill 100% of the tank with renewable diesel because chemically, it is the same as petroleum-based diesel. So it, it run, it's, uh, it, it's the, the, the product and, and the, where the, uh, the demand is coming from is the low carbon fuel standards started in California, spread to the North, Oregon, Washington. And there are other states, several other states that are considering um, some 
rules, regulations that would that, that would provide incentives for truckers in, in particular to use renewable diesel over petroleum-based diesel. So we, we're seeing this big increase in demand for renewable diesel. And following that is the most impressive wave of investment in the domestic crush market that we've ever seen, Brian. I, there, there's 400 to 500 million bushels of soybean crush demand coming online in the next three years if everything makes it to the finish line. Absolutely. And, and I think that uh, one of the critical factors we can't lose track of is, is where these plants are being built. Um, you know, they are being built in the Western Corn Belt with anticipation that a large part of those supplies will go to the West Coast, which you mentioned. Uh, California, Oregon, Washington, and so on. Uh, so, the, the, you know, that unto itself uh, creates basis opportunities for U.S. farmers out in, in that area. Uh, you know, we're talking about areas that have had wider than normal basis uh, when you compare them to some of the river markets and, and those types of things. Uh, not necessarily going to be the case anymore. Uh, they are trying to capitalize on an area uh, where they can produce not only the soybeans, uh, but they're not going to have to move them very far to produce the uh, the uh, renewable diesel and then ship it into the, the West Coast market. So I, I think that that's a critical component of, of what's going on here. And, and, you know, who knows where the where the demand eventually lands when all this is said and done, but it's going to be something fairly significantly bigger than what it is right now. Yep. Yep. That's that's a good way of putting it. Um, Two points. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Two points. Uh, well, actually, maybe three, but two. Number one, I, I think this uh, production capacity will come online. Um, number two, you know, you have to think about the rippling effect. I mean, six months ago, we thought that spring wheat acres were going to go up in 2022. It looks like that's not going to happen now. Yeah. And the price of beans and corn in North Dakota are just too high. And so if you put those plants around that area, that means more soybean acres, less spring wheat acres, and less beans going to the PNW. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a big thing that we have to um, look down the road as far as the impact it could have on farmers, especially in that Northern region. And then finally, a lot could depend on these midterm elections because the current administration is very green fuel oriented. Right. <clears throat> if they lose Congress, you know, we may not have that momentum. So, you know, it's very important to kind of see how the politics fit into this too. Absolutely. Ben, I'll ask you to comment on that. And that is answering Bell's question. How does Biden's plan for all electric vehicles play into this fuel conversation? Yeah, good question. So I, I get asked a lot uh, about especially private markets, um, every major vehicle company coming out with plans to, to have an entirely electric fleet of new vehicles by 2030. And the, the shock that people that feel based on that, uh, certainly, I think uh, it can be stated that it's, it takes a long time for the US vehicle fleet to turn over. And so even if we started selling all electric vehicles in, in 2028, 2020, or 2030, um, it would take you know another 15, 20 years to even get up to 60, 70 percent of the U.S. vehicle fleet. And this is that timeline uh, that you'll hear people talking about in terms of vehicle adoption. The the thing about renewable diesel is is it is you know almost impossible to electrify a jet engine plane. Uh, it is you know almost impossible to electrify a, an ocean liner. And so this is where you know renewable diesel has some some long term term legs uh, to to the process. It does have a low carbon intensity score. It fits into these markets where electrification is is very difficult, um, and and certainly it has it has some opportunities uh, from there. I, the one thing I'll also add in terms of where these locations are or these facilities are being built uh, holds a strategic advantage because you can pump it right into the pipeline. You have access to natural gas. Uh, certainly the soybean demand in the region as well. And so I think um, I. It, it does uh, seem like an emerging industry that has some legs in terms of how fast and how quickly it can be built. Yeah, and we do need to talk about the sustainable aviation fuel uh, as, as we continue this conversation. 
Um, I'm going to throw this one out. Does renewable, this is from Steve. Does renewable diesel have a better carbon footprint? Is that why this is more preferred? I think Dan, you know, answered that. Yeah. But I think that um, certainly there were meetings early in 2021 at the White House about uh, using soybean oil as a feedstock for jet fuel. And that seemed to be approved. <clears throat> the problem is we don't have enough soybean oil to satisfy that demand if everybody does it. So I think that um, it is, I think, you know, maybe Dan has a comment about it, but I think that um, the demand is on paper and the supply might be a little bit ahead of that. But I think it's something that the soybean market has to be aware of. Right, Dan? Well, to Steve's point, if we really model this out and we diminish the U.S. biodiesel industry in half, we still need 28 to 30 million extra acres of soybeans by 2025 if you take an 11.7 pounds per bushel and then you assume that 80% of the plants projected and coming online actually get built and in, in come into production at that same kind of refinery average. Most refineries would tell you in the energy field that they run at 95 to 97, so I'm being conservative. That all said, you know, it, it, I agree with Steve. These plants are going to get built. They are billions of dollars behind them, and it is really big oil. So it is that stepping stone. Uh, green fuels are that stepping stone electrification, but it is going to take 10 or 15 years of, of, of longevity, to Ben's point, before we really get there. But it's an exciting new demand driver. Uh, we are going to stretch agriculture in ways that we can't imagine today, but we just don't fully understand it on paper because there's so many moving parts. Very good, very good. The, um, the, the, the big difference, people are trying to compare what's happening in renewable diesel right now to what happened with ethanol 2005, six, seven, leading up to the RFS in 2007. RFS launched this, the big round of investment by producers into the US ethanol business. What was missing at that time was investment from big oil was investment from automakers uh, showing that they would embrace ethanol. When we look at this situation now, big oil is investing in the development of the crush capacity, the soybean crush capacity for the production of vegetable oil, of soybean oil, so that they can have first dibs on the vegetable oil that is produced at these plants to take it to their refineries and turn it into renewable diesel. It's a partnership that seems a little weird, but it makes it it, it makes it different than than the ethanol boom, doesn't it, guys? Yep, I would I would say it's much more disruptive. I, I think this is going to be much more disruptive in terms of plannings and and what finally comes in markets than what we saw with ethanol. But I'll let Steve and Ben and, and Brian chime in, but that's how we see it at Egg Resource anyway. Except, Brian, jump in. It's except, uh, I'll use Dan's word. It's exceptionally disruption, disruptive to the bean market. It's going to domesticate the bean market. Yes, and, and it is different than ethanol. Um, you know, it, the, the whole ethanol thing, it, it took uh, four mentions, five mentions, whatever, in the State of the Union address uh, back in 2005 mm -hmm. to get Wall Street money behind it. And, and that's kind of what kicked it off. Um, from that point forward, uh, you know, then, then we saw the whole, uh, basic business model unfold where we build an ethanol plant everywhere. Um, some of them didn't make it. They were sold for pennies on the dollar. Big oil then came in at that point in time and invested because they could make money off of it. Let's be honest, it, they're all in the business of making money. If they, if they can make money and they're upfront on the investment on this one, they feel like they can make money or they wouldn't be doing it. And that, and that is a major difference. Right. Dan, uh, talk to me about the agreement that ADM out of Cedar Rapids has an ethanol production plant with, is it with Marathon to make sustainable aviation fuel? Is that who it, no, that's not right. It's, it's GIVO. GIVO, yeah, I was gonna say, otherwise Mr. Freed at ADM would be better off answering the question. Since I didn't know right if there. Mr. Freed at ADM would wanna answer that question. Steve, you're on mute. You know, it's, it's a little close to home. I think. Um, so I, again, there's a Chinese wall between me and, and ADM and, and it's hard for me to talk about certain things. And, and so um, 
I, I do think that uh, a lot of the commercials are looking ahead of a period of higher demand. Uh, whether you're talking about wheat, corn, beans, you know, yeah. whether you're talking about inflation, uh, whether you're talking about uh, weather, um, all these things suggest that the demand is is better than the supply. And so I think that that's what's driving the markets right now. Right. And I think that when you get $16 beans and maybe higher, $7 corn, maybe higher, $9 wheat, maybe higher, money goes to that area to yep. try to take advantage of margins and, and try to take advantage. And we don't always stay at $16 beans or $7 corn and, and $9 wheat. So we have to make sure that the people that are coming in are coming in for the long haul rather than just kind of looking at uh, maybe something like the PIC program or you know something that is just something that didn't last very long. But I think right. that you know we can go back and talk about the next 20 years and the number of people that are gonna be in the world, the number of people that are gonna be in middle class and plug in a little bit less weather than maybe what we've seen over the last 20 years. And it, it, it's, it's pretty impressive that you know, these prices could stay at these levels for a while. Right, right. Dan, can you comment on ethanol's role in sustainable aviation fuel? It's not just a, it's, it's not just a veg oil market. It's no, ethanol's no, it involved. Is, no, so as to Brian's point, or maybe it was Ben's, you don't want to get into an airplane that's, you know, leaving on batteries. So right. electrification of the air fleet is not going to happen. And when you look at their demand, it's, it's really demonstrative. And so ethanol is one of those byproducts that can go into sustainable aviation, sustainable aviation fuel, SAF. And it's a big deal. We think it's that bridge that as we get electrification of the auto fleet, that the airlines industry will kick in and give us that demand that will keep ethanol at about 15 to 16 billion gallons longer term, such that we don't see a diminishment of the ethanol industry. We just see a change of where that product is heading. Gotcha. Ben? What do you I fully I fully agree with Dan, by the way. Okay. So go ahead, Chip. Dan, what I'm gonna just pick a number, 20, pick a marketing year, 2627. Okay, the 2627 marketing year. What might bean crush be? So I can tell you what our factory number is, but it's gonna be way lower than what it is. Um, you know, so <laughs> we could we could look um, we could probably look out and see bean crush in the neighborhood of, of three and a half um, billion bushels maybe, but it's, it's um, you know, it, it's going to be substantially higher than where we're at from a, from a factory baseline. And for that matter, what a USDA is, is that for a, for a baseline, mostly because both those organizations, the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute and, and USDA um, are taking into account uh, consistent policy. And so I think, I do not believe that we have a full idea of what, what future policy is going to, to be for this market. Uh, as, as, we, as we move ahead. I, I don't mean to go back to a subject we were talking about, but I was about oh, to yeah. say I, I disagree a little bit when you were talking about the, the big oil was not in ethanol. I, I was going to counter and say the big oil wasn't in ethanol at the beginning, but it certainly got there. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it's there now suggests that, yes, it, they, they maybe have learned something from the ethanol market and are applying to this as, as we go forward. But I also wonder how much international crush is going to play into this as well. Um, certainly, the European Union has the opportunity to potentially be a source of vegetable oil to the world, um, or at least excess capacity to where we export soybeans to them and they crush soybeans. Those numbers would not show up in our domestic crush numbers here in the U.S., um, but they would show up in the export tar targets um, until we get crush facilities built here. So that's my two-handed economist answer to your very simple question, Chip. <laughs> but I do think soybean crush will continue to increase. Um, but I would also counter to say that I think international exports from the United States could also be soybean crush that brings oil back to the United States. Fair, fair comment. Absolutely, absolutely. Steve, what you said is, I, I think really bottom lines, the long-term, longer-term outlook for the grain markets. We're going to use more corn than what we can produce over the next few years. 
We're going to use more soybeans and what we can produce over the next few years. Wheat, it looks like it might get there. Cotton might even play a role in that. Let's go ahead and throw barley into the equation as well. What it comes down to is all of these crops want the same acreage base. And in order to get the share that they want, they got to bid more aggressively, right? I, I think so. I think that um, the March planning intentions is going to tell us a lot about what the farmer thinks. And I think he's going to plant ditch to ditch. And I think that that's something that uh, the market has to be aware of. But, you know, we're maybe 10, 12 million acres total below what our maximum record was. Yeah. But a lot of that, um, you know, is in the CRP and, and some of it in hay. And, and, and so I think that the, the big thing is that we really don't have a lot of additional acres. Um, and then we'll see what Mother Nature does as far as rainfall. Because uh, again, I think we're in a period in which rainfall may be a little less than what we've seen over the past whether you want to blame La Nina, whether you want to blame 18 year cycles or oscillators or, or whatever you want to uh, blame it on. But um, I think there's a real challenge ahead to get more acres, have record yields to satisfy this demand. Okay. Brian, before we start getting into some of the questions that, that are starting to stack up here a little bit, what does it all mean to the farmers out there? Well, uh, if demand outpaces supply, uh, it means periods of higher prices. Uh, you know, if if we see um, the renewable diesel really kick off, and and that means stronger basis in, in that western northwestern Corn Belt area. Uh, you know, in all likelihood, if if you see higher prices, you're going to see higher input prices. That's just you know, high prices raise the price of everything else, and and uh, so you would be in an inflated environment. Um, you know, higher prices create more risk. Uh, they create more opportunity, but they also create more risk. Uh, so you're gonna have to be a better risk manager as a producer. Uh, you're gonna have to, to lock in when you have profitable opportunities. It's really easy to sit back and say, well, $17 beans, but what if it goes to $18 and not do anything about it? $6 you know, $7 corn, and what if it goes to $8 and not, not do anything about it? The opportunity is to lock it in, lock in those prices when you have profitable opportunities. And, and I think that that's the biggest thing for the producer is taking advantage of the opportunity when it's presented to you by the marketplace. Yep, good, good. But a sustained opportunity that will be there and give us an opportunity. Um, okay, Floyd asked the question, did I understand that beans will maybe may be exported to Europe, crushed there and the oil imported back here? Yes. Uh, this one is from Dave. Uh, let's go to Steve on this one first. If Russia continues to expand their invasion of Ukraine, do you see China making a move on Taiwan? If so, won't the U.S. put an immediate embargo on grains to China? Well, today there was an article out about, um, you know, the what ifs. Um, and certainly... Recently, Russia, Putin, China, Xi have become uh, partners. And the perception, number one, is that China has Russia's back in case there's sanctions. And China will give Russia what they need in product at a discount. And a lot of that, according to this author, has to do with Russia having China's back if they want to invade Taiwan. And so you have two partners there that are extremely important in global demand. I mean, if all of a sudden uh, we do something, a sanction against China, I mean, prices won't stay here very long. They'll, they'll go a lot lower. And so um, I think that we're walking on uh, thin ice over the next four to five months with, on one hand, demand bullish, but on the other hand, politics could step in and really throw a monkey wrench in, into a lot of things. Perfect. Perfect. That leads us into the next question that I was going to send to Ben first. How can ag plan for changes in administrative swings? Has history taught us anything? 
to get ahead of this, regardless of who's in office? I wish I had an answer. Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, there's a lot of days where I actually feel like the markets are more predictable than political administrations, um, and that and that's the honest truth. Uh, certainly, we see some some interesting things happening right now in the oil market that probably wouldn't have, wouldn't be happening if it wasn't an election year. Uh, to be to be truthful, um, there. So it, it's it's always challenging uh, when we think about this. You know when I read that question a while ago, and then when you just read it back to me, the first thing I thought of was how do, how do producers plan for raising interest rates um, across different political administrations? Yeah. Um, that has traditionally, or I shouldn't say traditionally, in recent years, that has been one issue where both Republicans and Democrats, regardless of who is in office, um, both agree on. Uh, suppressing or keeping interest rates artificially low has different meanings for both parties, but it certainly leads to the same result of, of keeping interest rates low. Is that changing? Are we interested in raising interest rates to fight, you know, food inflation? Um, and or you know, food and gas aren't included in the CPI, but they certainly matter when it comes to voters. Um, and so I think that's something we think about when long term. So I don't know if I have a really great answer to how to handle risk across different administrations because there's been no historical pattern. I'd be interested to hear what my panelists, my fellow panelists that have lots more experience than this have to say. I did not grow up in the 80s. I grew up in the long shadow of the 1980s, <laughs> uh, but certainly it is it is a challenge. And I certainly understand the producer um, sentiment uh, and, and concern around all these issues. Yeah, Brian, this is this is the kind of thing that you like to, to follow. Um, is there any way that AG can plan for those kinds of administrative changes? Oh, you know, Chip, I, I wish there was. I don't think that there necessarily is. Uh, there's just so much um, contentiousness in, in Washington right now that I, I just don't see it happening, um, to be honest with you. Um, we are going to face higher interest rates. That's a, that's a big one that, uh, you know, that yep. um, Ben brought up. And, and I, that's all involved in that, you know, more opportunity, more risk that I talked about. And, and, you know, you, you just, you have to plan the best that you can and you plan not only for now and not for next week or next month, but 18 months out, 24 months out, the best that you can. Right. And you, you use that, the outlook that you have and you keep that what, 18 to 24 month window open um, and try to try to pontificate the best you can in terms of, of what the outlook will be uh, moving forward. Uh, and then you adjust. You, ha you have to be able to adjust relatively quickly if we have a black swan event, if we have right. a, a, something that, that changes the outlook. Um, let's be honest, we're talking about commodities here. So while demand is outproducing or demand is, is outpacing supply at the moment, um, you know, even with the, all the bullish demand stuff that we've talked about, uh, everything is cyclical and we will find a way to produce more whether it's mother nature giving us better weather for an extended couple of years period or whatever the case may be, we, we will find everything is cyclical in commodity markets. Right, okay. I, I would just throw this out there on the change to the administration. If the change in the White House happens in 2024, no guarantee, I'm just suggesting it, uh, don't declare liquid fuel dead yet. Liquid fuel is gonna be a major player in our energy supply going forward. Uh, even if the White House would stay in the Democrat party in 2024, don't underestimate liquid fuel. It, as Ben and, well, as everybody has, has addressed, it's going to take time, a lot of time, and we've got some technology to develop and a lot of hurdles to cross before we get to this electric vehicle utopia that the current Biden administration thinks that we should be driving in. It, it's just going to take longer to get there than, than what many think. Okay, um, I wanna go back to this one on the export side of things, it, on soybeans. S Steve Freed, we talked about, uh, or you mentioned that they're not real interested in the 2021 crop beans. They are interested, China, they are interested in 22 crop beans and are they interested in 23 crop beans? 
23 is a long way out there. I mean, you wouldn't expect South America to have three bad crops in a row. Right. So I, I assume that they feel that, you know, there'd be some beans out of uh, Brazil. Um, you know, the question mark, I guess, is just what's going on inside of China as far as yeah. uh, the, the feed rations, um, the crush margins are negative, the feed margins are negative, um, the hog herd is, is rebounding. Um, but again, uh, $16 beans seems kind of high for them right now versus $14 beans. Um, and I, I think that a farmer needs to realize that China is pretty important to soybean prices. Um, and I think that we used to have just one harvest. Now we have two harvests in the world for soybeans. And uh, so I think that uh, the soybean market, uh, to me, uh, needs some more demand to push higher um, versus the corn market. I think that demand is already in there uh, to push higher. Okay. All right. Very good. Dan, uh, when it comes to China, we can't forget they've got a, they built a crush industry based on importing soybeans. They're not going to give that up. No, they're not. They've, they've got twice the amount of crush that they import of soybeans or nearly that, 180 million metric tons. So the Chinese are not giving up crush. They're not going to start importing the excess meal that will be coming from renewable diesel. So it's, it is a fight of, of that nature. And we are going to have an awful lot of meal coming forward. But listen, we need consecutive record crops in the United States and China if you're going to have any strong relaxation of prices. Okay. Um, and that's really why farmers need to leave their upside exposure there and maybe use crop insurance or some kind of put option so that they can maximize should another U.S. weather problem occur. But, you know, we haven't spoken a lot about South American crops, Chip. And, you know, this is a one for the record books. I mean, our, our firm in Sao Paulo has got the Brazilian bean crop under 123 million metric tons. If that's the case, we've lost close to 35 million tons of beans, 1.3 billion bushels, and that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. And back to back, Dan. Back oh, to when, back. You, when you look at the loss of safrina corn and now beans, I mean, it is something we never imagined in that climate. So, you know, and uh, we're, we're just planting a safrina corn crop now, and it's not out of the woods. We've still got 33% of that in the drought area. So, this is really important. And as you look at the modeling, it's difficult to figure out how the world has enough beans, even with a record US harvest going forward. My end stocks for new crop are still below 100 million bushels, and that gives a lot of support even to the new crop market. Excellent. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the hour. I want everybody to get that closing comment into their head when I go to Brian Grady right now for a comment. And, and Brian, I'm going to get your closing comment after this question. Talk to me about the livestock markets quickly, because there is, we, we've only talked about the grain markets, but there's some dynamic markets in livestock. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, really dynamic when you look at the feed side of things, too. So we need higher meat prices, uh, higher cattle and hog prices to offset the, the higher feed prices. So uh, what you're talking about is just an inflationary environment across commodities as a whole. But the livestock producer is able uh, to lock in stronger uh, production costs right now. What the, the, the real struggle is on the feed side of things yeah. uh, with what the soybean meal is doing, with what corn is doing, those types of things. Uh, you know, DDG prices are, are elevated and rising at the moment. And, and so, you know, it, it is a, a struggle on that end of things. And, and um, you yeah, know, and then the just the feeder cattle prices, yeah. um, you know, um, feeder pig prices is everything is really inflated at the moment. Talk to me about market animal supplies, both market hogs and fat cattle. So uh, yeah, we're seeing a, a reduction in our animal uh, consuming units. Uh, so on the feed side of things, uh, that would reduce our, our feed demand uh, to some degree. Uh, you don't see a major reduction there. Um, you know, you'd have to see a, a huge drawdown, but uh, uh, the cattle, uh, you know, we're contracting and, and contracting in a big way there. Uh, the, the actual contraction in the cattle inventory report was much greater than what was anticipated. Uh, drought has something to do with that uh, in all likelihood. Uh, we're, we're just moving more heifers into the, the feedlot at this time. 
Um, you know, that, that means that they're not there to be bred and, and to uh, increase our calf supply. So we're going to see our, our cattle numbers decline for probably the next one to, to two years at least, uh, and maybe beyond that, depending on what happens. On the hog side of things, um, you know, it, we'll, we'll see. Uh, the hogs and pigs report, uh, it looks like it, it you know, the, the numbers were down about 6%. Uh, looks like they may be down even a little bit more than that right. uh, when all is said and done. And there's been major revisions to H&P numbers yep. uh, all the way back. So they, they go back up to two years and, and um, just been an incredible revisions uh, to some of those numbers, both up and down. Uh, it, it, they haven't been all in one direction. And you know, one quarter has been up significantly and the next quarter has been down significantly. It wouldn't make sense that that would be the case, but uh, they're just off on their, their survey numbers when, when they release yep. them initially. Yep. And behind all of that in the background is solid demand for beef and solid demand for pork. Okay, we're, we're into the last three, four minutes. I'm going to start with Ben Brown. Let's get your closing comments, thoughts. Thanks, Chip. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, in the short term, there's a couple of things I'm watching for. One, the development of any dryness across the north central part of Brazil, uh, especially for that Safrinha corn crop. The model certainly suggests that it remains dry. Um, they have increased their acres of, of that Safrinha second crop corn. Uh, weather will dictate that region. The second thing I'm looking for in terms of weather is the western plains here in the United States, yes. um, where I'm at. Uh, certainly, if we see dryness and, and the drought, uh, especially from soil conditions, expand from where it's currently at in that southern plains and western Missouri up into Nebraska, if we see that expand and then set a high pressure system right there, um, you know, that expands our dryness um, even further. So what we're looking for there is, is the water temperatures off the coast of Alaska, certainly in the short term looking for that. Uh, I think in just general comments, I'm, I'm very supportive of, of many prices as we move ahead. Soybeans scare the crap out of me um, because... <laughs> There's a lot of fundamentals, uh, you know, U.S. putting sanctions on China for in, uh, invading Taiwan. If that were to happen, soybean prices would crash. Um, the increase in soybean acres here in the United States, if fertilizer prices continue to, to suffer or if we have challenges with the corn crop planting. Uh, so there's there's a lot of downside risk in soybeans and it scares the crap out of me because I could see right. soybeans going higher, but I could also see them trading a lot lower. And then just on the cattle side. Um, supply side fundamentals certainly support higher prices and then demand side fundamentals. Even with higher beef prices, the consumer is still going to the meat counter and buying beef. So. Absolutely. Good stuff, Ben. Um, just Steve Reed. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, secondly, what I look for every day is money flow. Um, we're, we're seeing um, money moving out of the equity market, whether it's because of higher rates, inflation, or whatever, and going into the commodity markets. Um, it's kind of a big deal if somebody wants to move a hedge fund out of equities into corn. Um, all of a sudden, uh, it's not a fundamental like supply and demand, but it's something that moves the price higher. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of watching that. The number two thing that I'm watching is weather. I, I think that Dan uh, talked, uh, Ben talked about spring and summer weather patterns. And the weather consultant that we use is dry. And so um, I always remember the first weather guy that I ever talked to said he hopes he's 50% right about 30% of the time on long range weather. <clears throat> but I think this year it is a little different. Um, and so um, besides that, uh, I think the farmer is being very uh, good at, at selling rallies, locking in profits. Uh, we're seeing data where land prices are record high. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, tractors and combines being sold. And when you talk to a farmer, it seems like he's worried about the dryness and he's worried about the cost. But I think he's in a really good financial situation right now. Okay. And he has to make a lot of decisions in the next two years with prices where they're at. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Dan Bossy. Hit your mute there, buddy. There you go. First of all, uh, thank you to you, Chip, and uh, Farm Journal, and to my fellow panelists. Well done. And uh, I think as you think about these markets, 
you know, there's a, it doesn't take much to push us to record highs in corn and soybeans. And so, you know, uh, I, I, I've never seen markets maybe as, as bullish as we sit with the geopolitics that produces a lot of volatility. So anyway, as we think about the future, there's lots of uh, volatility, but farmers, as I said earlier, are smiling. Only their input costs are going up, but we think they're going to have a very good year. Back to you, Chip. All right. Thank you. And Brian, this is bullish a group as I, I, I expected them to be price friendly. I didn't expect them to be as bullish as they are. Yeah, really bullish, actually. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit more of a 30,000 foot view here and just say, you know, we're in historic times. Yeah. Um, potential to move to record prices in, in both the corn and, and uh, soybean markets, wheat also potentially, I suppose, uh, on that angle. But, uh, um, you know, several of them touched on it already. And, and you know, great opportunity, a lot of risk, um, something I mentioned earlier. Uh, don't get caught watching uh, right. because it's really easy during, you know, they, they say records are meant to be broken and, and that type of thing. But, don't get caught watching because a lot of times if you're caught watching it, it can turn into a car crash or a train wreck or whatever in, in a hurry in front of you. Uh, so just keep that in mind as, as the American producer is uh, take advantage of the, the historic opportunities that you're being given right now. Excellent. Excellent. Dan Bossy, Ag Resource Company out of Chicago. Thank you, buddy. You're welcome, Chip. Enjoy All right, Ben. Ben Brown, University of Missouri, is great having you in the conversation, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Chip. Always enjoy it. All right, Steve Freed, hopefully I'll see you out on the lake here pretty soon. Yeah, we, we kind of get fishing. It calms the nerves. <laughs> we, we need to get some of that done. Brian Grady, thank you, sir. You bet you, Chip. Good job, Dan, Steve, and Ben. Uh, been a pleasure. All right, good stuff. And thank you so much for listening. The power of pro, of programmatic advertising is going to be the next farm country update that's on march 16th 2022 again thank you so much for joining us we'll see you on march 16th